It sweeps away the cuttings made by the bit and carries them to the surface for disposal. Mud also provides a means for keeping underground pressures in check, since a hole full of mud exerts pressure, just as a swimming pool full of water exerts pressure, which is why your ears sometimes hurt when you dive to the bottom of a deep pool. The weight or heavy density of the mud can be used to contain pressure in the formation. A hole full of mud that weighs the right amount usually will not blow out. But sometimes the unexpected occurs when the pressure in the formation becomes greater than the pressure exerted by the mud down hole. Then formation fluids can enter the well bore. And if the kick is not spotted and controlled, a blowout could occur. The drilling fluid, the mud, provides the first line of defense against blowout. But in order to get the mud into the hole, a machine has to move that heavy fluid. That machine is called the mud pump. The mud pump is the heart of the drilling rig just as your own heart acts as a pump and pushes blood through the veins and arteries. The mud pump forces the drilling fluid through the network of pipes and hoses that form the circulating system of the rotary rig. Let's zero in on the circulating system. What is it? How does it work? The equipment in the circulating system includes a large number of components. First on the list is the mud pump. Pumps take mud from the pits and push it through the discharge line, up the standpipe, down and around the rotary or Kelly hose, and through the swivel. From the swivel, mud then goes down the Kelly, through the drill pipes and collars, and exits at the bit. It then does a sharp U-turn and heads back up the annulus, the empty space between the outside of the drill string and the wall of the hole. Finally, the mud leaves the hole through a steel pipe called the mud return line and empties over a vibrating screen-like device called the shale shaker. The screen of the shale shaker, however, is not fine enough to catch very small particles which could erode the drill string and increase mud density to an undesirable level if left in the mud. So. Desilters and desanders are used to remove the smaller bits of rock and sand when necessary. A degasser is the last important component of the circulating system. Sometimes small amounts of formation gas enter the mud as it circulates down hole. This gas can make the mud too light, which might cause a blowout like the one we saw earlier, if the mud is not dense enough to prevent formation fluids from entering the hole. When the mud is finally free of cuttings, fine particles of silt or sand, and unwanted formation gas, it drains back down into the pits and is recycled down hole once more by the mud pump. But now, let's focus on the heart of the circulating system, the pump itself. and triplex pumps are the ones we'll talk about most because they're used on the majority of rigs. Let's take them apart and see how they work. Duplex means the pump has two pistons, each of which moves back and forth inside the cylinder shown here. If we took a saw and cut the pump down the center of this right-hand cylinder, a cross-section would look something like this. If we now focus on the fluid end, you can see that each piston moves back and forth in a removable liner which fits inside the fluid cylinder. From this side view, it's clear that each cylinder is attached to two intake valves and two discharge valves, 
which are concealed inside these valve covers. Inside the cylinder, these valves are forced open and shut by fluid movement. As the piston pushes forward, it creates a suction in the chamber, which causes the intake valve on the right to open. At the same time, the fluid which the piston pushes against the discharge valve on the left forces it to open too. This allows the mud to flow into the discharge line. On the return stroke, the action reverses. This forces the opposite suction and discharge valves into operation. The suction created in the chamber liner by drawing the piston back to its starting position opens the intake valve on the left, while the pressure of the mud pushing against the discharge valve on the right forces that valve open. Once more, the mud can flow into the discharge line. Because the duplex releases mud into the discharge line on both the forward and return strokes of the piston, this type of pump is called double acting. The triplex pump differs in two obvious ways from the duplex. First, it has three cylinders rather than two. Secondly, inside these cylinders are pistons, which are single acting, not double acting like the duplex. Let's take the pump apart and see what this means. If we cut this cylinder in two, a side view would look like this. Like the duplex fluid end, which we saw a moment ago, the triplex also contains a piston and a removable liner, which fit inside the fluid cylinder. But unlike the duplex, each triflex cylinder is served by only one intake valve and one discharge valve, which work just like the ones in the engine of your car. That is, as the piston draws back, it pulls mud in through the intake valve on the bottom. Then as it pushes forward, the piston expels the mud through the discharge valve on the top. Triplex pumps are not double acting, but single acting. That means the pistons expel mud into the discharge line on the forward or power stroke only. Duplex and triplex are both reciprocating pumps. Reciprocating means a back and forth action, so a reciprocating mud pump is one that moves drilling fluid by pistons that are pushed back and forth inside the green liner by these two rods. If we turn back to the cross section once again, you can see that the piston rods are pushed by the pony rods, which are moved back and forth by the cross heads, the eccentric straps, the bull gear and the pinion gear. All of these in turn are powered by chains or belts that are turned by an electric motor or a mechanical compound. The basic purpose of all this powerful machinery is to put the mud under pressure. Why? Because a certain amount of pressure is needed to overcome friction between the mud and whatever it contacts as it moves through the circulating system. This is called circulating pressure. If we start with an assumed pump pressure of 2400 PSI, or pounds per square inch, we can follow the mud through the circulating system and see just how much pressure is used up in each part of the system. The mud loses a little of its circulating pressure moving through the surface equipment, in this case, 100 PSI. It loses more as it moves down the drill string, perhaps another 500 PSI. And most of the pressure is expended in a jet stream at the drill bit. At this point, the mud has only 200 PSI left to get back up the annulus before it kind of runs out of steam and needs recharging at the pump. 
It's the job of reciprocating units like triplex and duplex pumps to provide sufficient pressure to move the mud through the circulating system. If the pumps are down, drilling stops. By this time, you should have a pretty clear idea of how a reciprocating pump works. More often than not, however, duplex and triplex pumps are backed up by another kind of mud pump on the rig. This one is called a centrifugal pump. Unlike reciprocating pumps, a centrifugal unit is a low pressure pump. It works along the same lines as a fan. The blades of the impeller shown here create a suction when they rotate. And that draws mud into the pump inlet. The mud is then sucked into the impeller casing and whirled around and out the discharge nozzle. Like a fan, the centrifugal pump works best for low pressure, high volume jobs, such as mixing up the dry mud components, regulating surface mud flow, and supercharging the suction lines of the reciprocating pump. In contrast to a duplex or triplex, a centrifugal pump doesn't normally exert much pressure on the mud, except during priming. Then the discharge valves should be partly closed while the suction valves are fully open. It's like turning on the spigot to a hose while keeping your thumb on the nozzle. It fills the lines with mud and keeps the pump from losing suction. But once you turn on the motor to the centrifugal pump, be sure to open the discharge valves again. Otherwise, the mud backs up against the impeller blades and discharge valve, which isn't good for the pump and could shorten the life of the impeller and housing. So far, we've talked about low pressure centrifugal pumps and higher pressured reciprocating pumps. Together, they make a good mud circulation team on the rig. But there's one member of the team, the most important one, that we haven't said anything about. And that's you. You're the troubleshooter on the team. And unless you can spot what's wrong and know what to do about it, the whole system can foul up. For example, just a moment ago, we were talking about friction and about the mud running out of pressure and coming back to the pump to be recharged. Well, you can make it easy for the pump to recharge the mud, or you can make it harder. Just by the way you hook up the suction lines leading to the pump. The longer you make those suction lines, the greater the fluid friction losses occur before the mud ever reaches the pistons and gets recharged. Effective suction is lost through a long suction line or one with lots of bends and right angles in it, or any suction arrangement which requires high lifting of the fluid. Why? The answer, once again, is pressure. You know that air has pressure, and the mud, of course, is heavy and hard to move. So if you put the mud in an elevated tank where the pressure of the air and the weight of the mud both push mud into the suction line, the pump will draw better. On the other hand, the least efficient suction system is one which requires the pump to draw mud up out of the pits. This arrangement is most likely to end up with the pump working overtime because the suction lines aren't full. It could also cause another problem in your pump, fluid knocking. This means that there's not enough pressure in the lines to push the mud in as fast as the piston accelerates. So, a vacuum is created between the piston and the mud. At some point, the mud finally catches up with the piston and smacks into it. When it does, a loud knock occurs. Troubleshooting to solve this kind of problem could take several forms. First, you should see if there are any bottlenecks and sharp turns in the suction line, which could cause uneven pressure in the line and slow down mud delivery to the pump. If substituting rounded corners doesn't solve the problem, it could be a collapsed suction hose or sand settling in the line, which is starving the pump and causing fluid knock. One way to detect sediment 
is to feel the temperature of the suction line, which is noticeably warmer where packed solids have not accumulated. But if the lines are clear and nothing appears to have collapsed, you may need to add a dampener to your suction system. This is especially true if you happen to have a small diameter suction line or a line which is a little too long. This dampener works as a miniature version of the elevated mud tank. It keeps pressure on the suction line and keeps the line full of mud. Built-in suction dampeners are also available. This flexible rubber dampener is being filled with 10 pounds of pressure and inserted into the suction manifold. The hose absorbs any surges in pressure from the incoming mud. If you're still hearing a fluid knock after installing a suction dampener, you may need to add a centrifugal pump to supercharge the suction line. The right size centrifugal pump enables duplex and triplex pumps to run at higher speeds before knocking occurs. In effect, it actually increases the horsepower of the reciprocating pumps by 10 to 20 percent and reduces wear on expensive duplex and triplex parts. The supercharging pump is especially important in preventing fluid knock in triplex pump. Otherwise, running a triplex at high speed can damage it in a number of ways, such as we've already mentioned the terrific shock which occurs when the piston meets the mud rushing into the cylinder. That shock passes through the piston and pony rods back to the power end of the pump. In addition, the valves strike their seats with a bang which causes further shock loading on the bearings and gears in the power end. The impact loading of the pistons and the slamming action of the valves wear out these parts at a much faster rate than usual. Well, you checked out the suction line from top to bottom. It's not full of sand or barite. It hasn't collapsed. It's not leaking at the fittings. Your suction dampener is working and the supercharging pump is online. Then why is that dumb pump still setting up a noise to beat the band? Perhaps it's not fluid knock after all. It could be a mechanical knock, which is generally at a higher pitch and often sounds like clanking metal. One way of finding out is to use your screwdriver as a stethoscope. If the noise is coming from a cylinder or one particular valve pot, or if you can locate a specific source of the knocking, it's probably mechanical. But if it seems general and hard to pin down, most likely it's fluid knock. Sometimes the pounding starts just after you've finished dressing out the pump. When this happens, there's always a good chance that one of the newly replaced parts is the source of the trouble. Let's take the cylinder head, for instance. It has to be cleaned and oiled before the plug is installed. And this is true of most of your fluid end components. Really eyeball the liner before putting the piston back in it. It could be nicked or scratched. One good way of checking is with your thumb. Sometimes you can feel a nick which isn't immediately apparent to your eye. The same is true of the piston. And when you find something, take a file and smooth out any rough spots before they lead to washouts. Then give the liner a coat of grease before the piston goes back in. And give the outside of the liner and the inside of the thread ring a thorough coat before fitting them back together. But this won't do any good unless the liner fits tight in the fluid end. If the liner is loose or not properly greased, Trouble will start as soon as the pump does. So while you're at it, check out the liner packing. A leaky liner packing may result in fluid cutting of the liner and pump walls. Even when the pump is running, there's an easy way to check by examining the telltale holes. Make sure these are cleaned out. These are especially important because they leak mud whenever the liner packing is leaking. Another possible trouble spot 
is the piston rod pony rod connection, shown here without the clamp. When you put the clamp back on, be sure it's screwed down tight. A loose piston will bang on every stroke. The leaky piston at the right will dump mud down into the liner wash tank. It should be corrected before a washout occurs. Sometimes, however, when the pump begins to knock as soon as you start it up, the problem isn't a loose connection. It could mean that the pump wasn't properly primed, which can cause all kinds of damage, especially to the resilient rubber piston head. It can be ruined in just a few strokes. This one was burned from improper priming. So if your pump doesn't have a flooded suction, prime it by hand, preferably with mud. The shutoff valve between the tank and the pump must be closed and the pump should be primed through all its valve pots before turning it on. If you do prime the pump with water to check it out, you should also do other maintenance at the same time, like taking a look at your discharge strainer. Unscrew the head. Let it drain. And clean out bits of rubber and trash caught by the strainer. When you connect up the strainer again, take a close look at your discharge line. Like the suction line, it should be kept short and as free from unnecessary bends as possible. Loops like these can magnify the effect of pressure surges in the line and cause it to vibrate and whip free. Pressure surges are even more troublesome in the discharge system than in the suction system because the mud is under far greater pressure. Note how short this vibrator hose is. This is a better arrangement. Also look at these high pressure hose ends. They are doubly secured with a chain so they won't whip loose in case of a break. Discharge piping should be welded instead of screwed down whenever possible. One way of reducing the hazards is to reduce the pressure surges which cause dangerous conditions to develop. A pulsation dampener on the discharge line absorbs pressure variation and reduces peak pressures. If we cut the dampener apart, you can see how it works. Inside is a rubber bladder. With each pressure surge, this rubber bladder compresses and that lets extra mud into the chamber. Between surges, the bladder expands again to normal size, which expels the mud slowly into the discharge line. This reduces pressure surges on downhole piping. So, before you start up the pump, prime the dampener with nitrogen. And check its nitrogen pressure gauge regularly. The pressure should be kept to manufacturer's recommendations, so the dampener will do its job correctly. While you're there, make sure the pressure relief valve on the discharge line is set correctly. If the hydraulic system becomes blocked, the relief valve will open, allowing excess pressure and mud to flow into the relief bypass line. Relief valve setting is normally a little higher than the liner working pressure. Adjust the valve by inserting the correct size pin for the pressure you want. And by the way, never use a nail or welding rod. It might not shear at the right pressure and then people or the pump could get hurt. When everything is checked out okay, the pump is once again ready for operation. Start it up, and you can start drilling again, confident it will serve you well.